David Sirota, friend of the show, recently published an article in Jacobin that was kind of similar to yours. Uh, he was looking at, you know, just the complete and utter collapse of the Biden agenda and the Build Back Better uh, Act. And he he asked the same question, are Democrats trying to lose on purpose? And um, the point of his article, um, again, sort of like yours, wasn't really to like actually get to the truth of the matter. But he was basically saying that Democrats have all but set themselves up for a midterm shellacking. Uh, I am inclined to agree with him, but I want to ask you guys, is there any way possible that this doesn't happen? <laughs> no, it's guaranteed. Yeah. They're gonna be they're gonna be destroyed. And I think like I don't I don't know if this is indicative of anything, but it does seem like people on you know, young people who when they do turn out really do help the Democratic Party who don't usually turn out in midterms of elections this year, but it does seem that there's a general cynicism amongst what the Democratic Party can do. And though even though young people do vote at lower rates, they're still an important constituency of the Democratic Party. So I think they're going to get creamed even more than like 2010. I think it's going to be a gigantic shellacking, Jen, to, to, mm. to, to borrow your phrase. Yeah. I don't see how they could possibly. Maybe if they made it Build Back Best and were inspired <laughs> right. by Melania. Yeah, right. Melania. Oh, God. Build Back Better. So they made it's fun of Melania because there's no articles in Slovenian. And she's saying, be best. And they're like, why didn't you say be the best? And she's like, that's what I'm saying. Be best. Yeah. And Build Back Better sounds so it much sound more good. ESL. Yeah. Doesn't it? it? <laughs> than be best. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think they're, they're toast. And again, we're all being a little cheeky here. But we do know they sacrifice some races because they think it's good for, for the long term, um, which means they do sacrifice some areas. And it's not because they don't have the resources. God knows. They're extremely bloated organiza organization. Um, but, you know, if they were trying to lose, if I were the Democratic Party and I was trying to lose on purpose... I would do exactly what they're doing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> wild. It's really wild. I mean, it's it's the the mandate, quote unquote, was so obvious for what I mean, Trump actually gave out money. It's wild. Right. He actually gave out money. It's it's really strange. I mean, not strange. There's all the reasons we talked about, but in the broad political history of the United States, it's very very a uh, bunch of weird moves. And there's a broader the like uh, overestimation of their own legitimacy. I mean, both the Democrats and the sort of media and you know uh, professional managerial class, whatever. Uh, it's a broad overestimation mm -hmm. of their own sort of legitimacy in the eyes of everyone else. And they're like, mm -hmm. well, if we call them racist enough, they'll do what we say. And they're like, oh no, uh, we don't like you or care about you. That's yeah. why we didn't vote or voted for the other guy. Cause we don't like you or care about what you think of us. Right. You can't call us something that we know we're not, or maybe they are. And they're just like, yeah, that's, I'm a racist. Yeah, but exactly. regardless, they're like, I don't understand how that's supposed to affect my habits or mindset whatsoever. And then that's precisely right, in my opinion. And I think it reflects the sort of post-Cold War, like hyper-partisan sorting, um, where liberals are in the Democratic Party and conservatives are in the Republican Party. It, it makes the message totally ineffective. Yeah. You know, and, and that probably relates, I would imagine. To Your enemies of, don't like you? Oh, no. Yeah. Mm, like it, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's wild. And that probably also relates to, do you remember like 10, 15 years ago, you guys remember about sort of like the, the argument that, that the Democrats would demographically always dominate. That was oh, like God. a really strong. Oh yeah. Thinking. Demography is destiny. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think like, there's a lot of people who were probably situated and formed in that era who unconsciously share a lot of those assumptions um, that really, it probably informs a political messaging. Oh, it's not just demography of like ethnicity or whatever anymore. Uh, now it's age. They don't seem to understand that children get older. <laughs> They're like, oh, but look how left a, this 16 year old is. And it's like, how many generations is it going to take <laughs> before you realize that the kids from Euphoria are going to be working on Wall Street? <laughs> right, like, right. I don't know why why they get it. I think in many ways it's kind of on a, on a psychological level an abdication of responsibility is to sort of like, oh no, they're going to save us. They're going to stop climate change. And it's like, you just want to not work. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's the weird sort of um, 
uh, putting on a pedestal of, of like Greta Thunberg, you know, uh, political pedophilia. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's like um, it's this this notion that the next generation will absolve the sins of the current generation, and I think that's why. Um, certain figures have become which so is convenient because they will expire before but, those kids are mad enough to yeah you know be like fuck you you hung us out to dry yeah yeah to be yeah yeah precisely so you know honestly this all leads me to something that i specifically wanted to ask you danny because you recently had a substack post which was <laughs> Kale, thank you. He's he's got it ready. Uh, the end of mass politics. A uh, pretty pretty bleak world outlook, I must say. Uh, the the post. I mean, I, I recommend that everybody reads it. Um, but one of the things you're looking at is whether mass politics is even possible anymore. Um, let's let's talk about that for a little bit. Uh, what what were you arguing, Danny? And 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 why sure. does so, why does the outlook for mass politics <laughs> is not not so rosy? I didn't necessarily want it to be bleak, but but to my opinion, if you're trying to, you know, quote unquote, think strategically, the, as the science of historical materialism teaches us, you have to be very aware of all, where power lies in our society. And I, and I just noticed on the left, broadly speaking, um, there seemed to be a, a lack of discussion about why it seems that, you know, some of the largest protests in American and probably world history didn't result in particular changes or why does it seem that there's absolutely no, you know, public opinion is X or Y on Medicare or child care and it never seems to happen. You know, why does it seem that there's no connection or that the power isn't influenced by the quote unquote public? Um, and one of the reasons, but, but at the same time, um, to explain that phenomenon in light of the fact that like political discussion and partisan sorting has become so intense, you know, has become so extreme, both among people who pay attention and then people who don't like, um, I was talking to Matt Grisman about, you know, these various things. He's like, yeah, I could read a headline and then I can know immediately like how this will be interpreted by both sides, mm -hmm. right? That it, it becomes a sort of passion play. Um, so you have this weird thing where polit politics doesn't seem to be affected by, you know, the quote unquote masses, but the masses talk about nothing but politics and they're, they're very clear scripts. And so one of the things that I was beginning to think, and I, Anton Yeager has done some really interesting work in this vein as well on his discussion of hyper politics and a really interesting interview with him on Alpha Bunga Bunga recently. Um, what I was starting to think is that maybe what we have is the overlay of institutions like the mass media, the mass political party. Um, and particular updates like social media, but really the, 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 these major institutions began in the 1920s to address newly politicized publics, you know, newly urbanized publics, people who are able to read, people who are able to be part of politics, and you get the rise of new mass political formations like the Democratic Party in the 20s or the Nazi Party or fascism. These are all part of the same large phenomenon, which is modernization and urbanization. So these are still the institutions within with, with which we exist, you know, the mass-based political party, um, the, the, the mass media, and this is still the language of politics. You know, people talk about protests going out and making change, mm -hmm. which did happen in the past, but why does there not seem to be? And so I was just, just, this was more of an exploratory issue, but to me, it seems that what has happened is that power lies totally outside um, any sort of democratic accountability, like relationship to the demos. On one hand, we have capital, um, and I'm sure like people listening to here know that capital is sort of this private thing and it is disconnected. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into the mechanisms of, uh, mechanism of that. But I think what's crucial is that coupled with capital, we've had the accretion over the last 75 years of a, of a state form um, that like literally people who provide services, who make decisions, et cetera, are either appointed bureaucrats on one hand, the people in the state, they're political appointees. So there's some connection to voting there, but there's this permanent deep state <laughs> to borrow a phrase um, on one hand. And then there's also this totally unaccountable network of think tanks and NGOs, which all of us here um, are very familiar with, which have no, absolutely no relationship to, to democratic accountability. So what you have is this weird public private state overlaid with the discourse and form of mass politics, but, uh, but to which there is no relation. And then just to end, and then you have capital sort of like directing things in various ways there. So that's what I was trying to get at, because I think getting the power constellation of society is the basis of any sort of meaningful left wing strategy, which, you know, if unless you're despairing post Bernie, you want to build something positive, you want to mm -hmm. build something up. And that was what I was trying to do there. Yeah. Uh, Am Amber, any additional thoughts on the prospects for mass politics uh, in an era of democratic failure? <laughs> Well, I mean, I would say that I like agree with Danny about like the state or lack yeah. thereof of mass politics, but I don't know that like prospects are really like where either of us go on this, mainly because there is like we the I don't know. I mean, like 
shit happens like there yeah. is there is always like this kind of chaos element to things yeah, you don't sometimes know it's a happen. pandemic mm-hmm. sometimes it's a Bernie Sanders <laughs> or whatever you never really know what's gonna stick so i mean i'm kind of sitting pretty and seeing what comes down the pipe yeah and i mean and that's what and that's what you got to do i mean i think it's important like it's funny to be ironic and like obviously despair is is covered over with humor but you to know despair is to turn your back on god right exactly so you you, you can't let basically what I consider to be a realistic analysis of the situation just leads you into doing nothing. You have to yeah, use yeah. that analysis to build. And it's yeah. like, this is how now is. Right, right. Um, it's not, yeah. and, it does, and now will yeah. change. We make history, yeah. but not of our own choosing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I, better, I like that. It's, I like that. Yes. It's not, it's not black pilled. It's a different kind of pilled. I don't know what that pill is yet, but it's the pill of like waiting for something bad shit to happen, which I It's endorse. a daily vitamin. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's that pill. Because <laughs> every day is a different day. Indeed. Um, but I mean, again, I think to me, I, the only thing I would emphasize is that institutions and class-based institutions yeah. are right. going to be the only way out of this, but the, the form that that would take or whatever what would you know create the conditions where they could form again isn't clear to me at all it's actually kind of exciting right because if if, if Mm. you do think like that that ultimately a lot of these things need to come from a class-based politics um or politics significantly inflected with with class or however you want to phrase it then that raises interesting questions like how does one organize in a in 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 an era where capital has successfully reshaped labor relations where people Mm -hmm. are working multiple jobs where unionization is at at a very low moment it just means we have to be more creative and we have to you know develop new models for the actual post post post-industrial economy that we're working with so in some sense this is actually an exciting time because we're not using the old sort of framework that it's very clear in my opinion that we need to adopt a new understanding of how to do that total side i mean i would say too like back on that because we don't have many manufacturing and sort of the conditions for you know mass labor that are guess what i don't work we don't make the thing anymore um i am i'm not sure of this and i go back and forth but i really do think any investment in domestic infrastructure and manufacturing Mm -hmm. would be the thing i actually think it's going or it's likely that that it it happens the same way it happened the first time right (laughs) Um, but it, that would require another industrial revolution. But there might be conditions where that's necessary. I mean, especially with like supply chain shit fucked up and it's becoming clear and clear that maybe we shouldn't get everything from somewhere else. Right, and, right. I mean, just in terms of pure shipping, I mean, if we're, if we're going to take any sort of like climate arrest or, and climate's like a big thing and I, I don't want to catastrophize, but you probably should be flying less or at least mm. we as a species should be flying less. So it turns out there are costs to, yeah. you know, rapacious capitalism, extraction and shipping things all over the world. So this actually vacation, presents opportunities. But the, yeah, but the fact that that's not really the major issue. The issue is that like, you know, you, you get paper from Malaysia instead of Canada, where there's the same so renewable resource. To take, to take a, an example I like to use, in the Pacific Northwest uh, in the 60s, what happened, they used to fell lumber and they used to process it in the Pacific Northwest. But in the 60s, they found that it was actually cheaper to ship to Japan, process it, and then ship back. Right. Wow. So there's lots of things like that that would like are in the, you know, that, that are forgotten that might actually make more sense given what we now know about climate change and, and mm-hmm. what we would want to do for a national domestic economy. I mean, although that, that doesn't necessarily benefit capital. I think the one, the one <laughs> possible opportunity of the pandemic is that they're like, oh shit, we can't keep doing this because right. all our stuff is over there. Mm-hmm. We need to have a backup plan in case this happens again. Maybe we actually have to risk the possibility of the workers unionizing again by having domestic manufacturing. Because like, like my mom was trying to uh, paint the house and she's like, there's a paint shortage. And like, I don't even know, I don't even know where we get paint. But apparently it's not here yeah, or one probably of the probably from all over the place, right? There's yeah. probably like 18 yeah. places around the world. And if people can't buy their paint, how's, how's capitalism going to keep running? And this is, I, I actually also think, an internationalist thing for people who might critique us for being like so focused on the national. If you actually ways 
um, remove that sort of opportunity from uh, foreign economies. I think you'll see more organization there and, and more worker justice there as well. Well, you can see like the, the actual development of manufacturing that a place like Mexico has been trying to do for years and years, <laughs> but we've undermined so but we can have like a, mm-hmm. yeah, because we have a, a, a mobile third world desperate workforce. Yeah, and it's all related to imperialism, as we're suggesting. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends.